Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide, and welcome back to Vampire Read-Throughs. Who wants more lady vampires? This tonight, we continue reading Carmilla by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu, the seminal work of early vampire fiction that greatly inspired Dracula. Without it, we would not have Dracula as we know it today. And yet, Carmilla is not as remembered. It's been better lately. In the past 10 years or so, I'd say Carmilla has become much more of a household name. But 20, 30 years ago, unless you were a serious vampire fan, which you all should be, but I know most of you are not, most people had never even heard of Carmilla. Or if they did, they didn't really know what she was all about. Carmilla did all right in its time when it was serialized and then published, but no more so than any of other Le Fanu stories. And have you read any of Le Fanu's other stories or even heard of them? The father of Victorian ghost fiction? Do you know any of his ghost stories? Carmilla may have fallen into obscurity and been forgotten entirely, if not for its adaptations. Yes, Carmilla was adapted into movies, uh, first in the 1960s in Blood and Roses, and then in the 1970s into The Vampire Lovers. And we really have those films to thank for bringing Carmilla back to popular consciousness. And if it wasn't for those films, we wouldn't be talking about it today. The thing you may know about Carmilla is that it's the prototypical lesbian vampire story. And lesbian vampires are a very staid vampire trope. When you think about vampires after Dracula, after the man in the cape and the widow's peak tropes, when it comes to women, you think lesbians. As we discussed last time, not all lady vampires were lesbians. In this book of all the lady vampires that existed before Dracula, This many came before Carmilla. Carmilla was the one who put lesbian vampires on the map. And as we read, you're going to find out why. So last we left off, we learned that Laura, a 19-year-old girl of English descent living in the remote Gothic land of Styria, in a remote Gothic house, a cashel, a schloss that's so beautiful and picturesque, is a very lonely girl. She lives with her father and two governesses and then, you know, like dozens of servants who don't count, in this Gothic castle. And she just wants a friend. She just wants a gal pal. And she was going to have a new friend come and stay with her for a while, but this friend unfortunately died before Laura ever even got the chance to meet her. Poor Laura. She was sad. For about five minutes, and then, as luck would have it, on a night of a full moon after a crimson sunset, a carriage happened to crash right in front of her house. And who would have guessed, but there was a young girl in this carriage who got bonked on the head and knocked out and therefore needed someone to look after her while her mom continued on her carriage journey of life and death. And the mom was like, what do I do with my daughter? I can't take her with me, but I couldn't possibly leave her here with you. That's just rude. And Laura's dad was like, no, please leave her here. Has my daughter mentioned she's lonely? She would love a new friend. So this young girl, whose name we don't know yet, who we haven't met yet, Actually, I don't think this has even told us Laura's name yet. Uh, I just know her name is Laura, so I'm referring to her that way. This young girl has just been left at Laura's castle with her father and two governess ladies, and we are about to meet her. In Carmilla, Chapter 3, we compare notes. Oh, also, Laura has noted that there is something fishy with this girl's mom. The way she was acting was extremely theatrical and melodramatic. And then all of a sudden, when she got the offer to leave her daughter there, she suddenly got like all serious business talk. And Laura's like, hmm, something's up with that. She's not acting like normal people do. But her dad, because he's a jolly old Disney dad, apparently, is just totally clueless and has no idea that anything's up or wrong. And Laura's like, hmm. Because as the prologue told us, Laura is a smart woman, a very clever woman who we should absolutely believe and not think that she just has nonsense in her head when she tells us of these strange supernatural things. Chapter 3. We compare notes. We followed the cortege with our eyes until it was swiftly lost to sight in the misty wood, and the very sound of the hoofs and wheels died away in the silent night air. Nothing remained to assure us that the adventure had not been an illusion of the moment, but the young lady, who just at that moment opened her eyes. Oh, how convenient. It's not like this was planned or staged or anything. 
I could not see, for her face was turned from me, but she raised her head, evidently looking about her, and I heard a very sweet voice ask complainingly, Where is Mamma? Our good Madame Peridon answered tenderly, and added some comfortable assurances. Then I heard her ask, Where am I? What is this place? And after that she said, I don't see the carriage. And Matska, where is she? Madame answered all her questions in so far as she understood them, and gradually the young lady remembered how the misadventure came about, and was glad to hear that no one in, or in attendance on, the carriage was hurt. And, on learning that her mamma had left her here till her return in about three months, she wept. Oh, come on, girl. It's not a bad place to be left. We've just spent two chapters being told how beautiful and picturesque it is. I was going to add my consolations to those of Madame Peridon when Mademoiselle de La Fontaine placed her hand on my arm, saying, Don't approach. One at a time is as much as she can at present converse with. A very little excitement would possibly overpower her now. So we're to understand that this girl is very delicate and sensitive and can't talk to more than one person at a time or she will be overwhelmed. As soon as she is comfortably in bed, I thought, I will run up to her room and see her. Laura really wants a friend. My father, in the meantime, had sent a servant on horseback for the physician who lived about two leagues away, and a bedroom was being prepared for the young lady's reception. The stranger now rose, and leaning on Madame's arm, walked slowly over the drawbridge into the castle gate. In the hall, servants waited to receive her, and she was conducted forthwith to her room. The room we usually sat in as our drawing room is long, having four windows that looked over the moat and drawbridge, upon the forest scene I have just described. It is furnished in old carved oak, with large carved cabinets, and the chairs are cushioned with crimson utrecht velvet. The walls are covered with tapestry and surrounded with great gold frames, the figures being as large as life in ancient and very curious costume, and the subjects represented are hunting, hawking, and generally festive. It is not too stately to be extremely comfortable, and here we had our tea. For with usual patriotic leanings, my father insisted that the beverage should make its appearance regularly with our coffee and chocolate. What a lovely gothic drawing room they're sitting in. I love the red velvet. I love the hanging tapestries, the golden frames. I want this house. We sat here this night, and with candles lighted, we're talking over the adventure of the evening. Madame Peridon and Mademoiselle de la Fontaine were both of our party. The young stranger had hardly lain down in her bed when she sank into a deep sleep and those ladies had left her in the care of a servant. "'How do you like our guest?' I asked as soon as Madame entered. "'Tell me all about her.' "'I like her extremely,' answered Madame. "'She is, I almost think, the prettiest creature I ever saw, "'about your age, and so gentle and nice.' "'She is absolutely beautiful,' threw in Mademoiselle, "'who had peeped for a moment into the stranger's room. "'And such a sweet voice,' added Madame Peridon. Did you remark a woman in the carriage after it was set up again who did not get out, inquired Mademoiselle, but only looked from the window? No, we had not seen her. She then described a hideous black woman with a sort of colored turban on her head who was gazing all the time from the carriage window, nodding and grinning derisively toward the ladies with gleaming eyes and large white eyeballs and her teeth set as if in fury. Yikes. So we've got a racist depiction of a black woman who is set up as a scary, frightening, intimidating figure, very voodoo priestess stereotype. She was in the carriage. She was watching everything that happened and grinning like she was up to something. Did you remark what an ill-looking pack of men the servants were? asked Madame. Yes, said my father, who had just come in ugly, hangdog-looking fellows as ever I beheld in my life. I hope that they mayn't rob the poor lady in the forest. They are clever rogues, however. They got everything to write in a minute. Ah, yes, that carriage completely crashed, but they got it all popped back upright in a minute. No broken wheels. Almost like the whole thing was staged or something. Not that Laura's dad would ever notice that bumbling buffoon that he is. Even though he thought the horse-riding servant sure looks sinister. I dare say they are worn out with too long traveling, said Madame. Besides looking wicked, their faces were so strangely lean and dark and sullen. I'm very curious, I own, but I dare say the young lady will tell us all about it tomorrow if she is sufficiently recovered. Oh yes, these servants weren't just kind of sinister looking. They were strangely lean and sullen, almost like someone had been drinking their blood out or maybe they were the kind of people who drank other people's blood out. 
Was this a whole pack of vampires that were driving this coach with a vampire voodoo priestess black woman in a turban inside the coach? All of this makes the beautiful, sweet-voiced young lady they pulled out of that coach seem, you know, great in comparison, doesn't it? Yeah. Lucky she got away from the sinister pack. I don't think she will tell us, said my father with a mysterious smile and a little nod of his head as if he knew more about it than he cared to tell us. This made me all the more inquisitive as to what had passed between him and the lady in the black velvet and the brief but earnest interview that had immediately preceded her departure. We were scarcely alone when I entreated him to tell me. He did not need much pressing. There is no particular reason why I should not tell you. She expressed a reluctance to trouble us with the care of her daughter, saying she was in delicate health and nervous, but not subject to any kind of seizure, she volunteered that, nor to any illusion, being in fact perfectly sane. How very odd to say all that, I interpolated. It was so unnecessary. <laughs> Why Why would this girl's mom being like, yes, my daughter is, you know, she's unhealthy and weak and frail, but don't worry, she's completely sane. I promise she, she is completely sane. And Laura's like, something's fishy here. And her dad's like, ha, 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 it's fine. I'm so British. At all events, it was said, he laughed. And if you wish to know all that passed, which was indeed very little, I'll tell you. She then said, I am making a long journey of vital importance. She emphasized the word. Rapid and secret. I shall return for my child in three months. In the meantime, she will be silent as to who we are, whence we come, and whither we are traveling. That is all she said. She spoke very pure French. When she said the word secret, she paused for a few seconds, looking sternly in her eyes fixed on mine. I fancy she made a great point of that. You saw how quickly she was going. I hope I have not done a very foolish thing in taking charge of the young lady. For my part, I was delighted. I was longing to see and talk to her and only waiting till the doctor should give me leave. You, who live in towns, can have no idea how great an event the introduction of a new friend is in such a solitude surrounded us. Now, has she mentioned she's lonely? All you people who live in towns with other people, you don't get it. She's lonely. So even though all this seems really fishy and weird to her, she's still excited to have this mysterious, beautiful young lady who her mother has promised will not say a word about her identity. In case you want to ask, she's not going to answer your questions. Know that right now. I mean, knowing what we know that these characters are vampires, or at least Carmilla is, um, seems funny to me that she couldn't have just like come up with a backstory, just like a plausible backstory and be like, here's my identity. And said she has to be like, nope, not going to say a word about my identity. And therefore you must never ask me questions. It makes me wonder if there's this trope of like vampires can't lie. So it's a lie of omission instead. Like she wouldn't be capable of fabricating that. That's a thing. Like, you know, the vampire can't technically lie, can't enter without invitation has to be honest, so it has to find loopholes to get around these things. The doctor did not arrive until nearly one o'clock, but I could no more have gone to my bed and slept than I could have overtaken on foot the carriage in which the Princess Velvet had driven away. So now she's assuming Carmilla's mom is a princess because she keeps hinting that she's very important and her journey is vital. Emphasis on the vital. She's an important personage. When the physician came down to the drawing room, it was to report very favorably upon his patient. She was now sitting up, her pulse quite regular, apparently perfectly well. She sustained no injury, and the little shock to her nerves passed away quite harmlessly. There could be no harm certainly in my seeing her, if we both wished it, and with permission, I sent forthwith to know whether she would allow me to visit her for a few minutes in her room. Even though it's one in the morning, she really wants to see this girl. Laura has not gone to bed. She stayed up till one in the morning. She really wants to see this new friend. The servant returned immediately to say that she desired nothing more. You may be sure I was not long in availing myself to this permission. Our visitor lay in one of the handsomest rooms in the Schloss. It was perhaps a little stately. There was a somber piece of tapestry opposite the foot of the bed, representing Cleopatra with the asp to her bosom, and other solemn classic scenes were displayed, a little faded upon the other walls. Oh, are all the scenes on the other walls historical figures killing themselves? Because, you know, that's not ominous. Sounds like my kind of room. But there was gold carving and rich and varied color enough in the other decorations of the room to more than redeem the gloom of the old tapestry. Hey. Gloomy old tapestries are great. They do not need redemption. There were candles at the bedside. She was sitting up, 
her slender, pretty figure enveloped in the soft silk dressing gown, embroidered with flowers and lined with thick quilted silk, which her mother had thrown over her feet as she lay upon the ground. What was it that, as I reached the bedside and had just begun my little greeting, struck me dumb in a moment? It made me recoil a step or two from before her? I will tell you. I saw the very face which had visited me in my childhood at night, which remained so fixed in my memory, and on which I had for so many years so often ruminated with horror, when no one suspected of what I was thinking. So, the first chapter, as we read, she has a memory of childhood of being visited by a ghostly lady in her bed who drove two needles into her breast and then disappeared, which everyone gaslit her into thinking was a dream. But now, this girl who just got dropped off on her doorstep in the moonlight, crimson sunset, has the same face as the woman from that dream. It was pretty, even beautiful, and when I first beheld it, wore the same melancholy expression but this almost instantly lighted into a strange fixed smile of recognition. There was a silence of fully a minute, and then at length she spoke. I could not. How wonderful, she exclaimed. Twelve years ago, I saw your face in a dream, and it has haunted me ever since. Wonderful indeed, I repeated, overcoming with an effort the horror that had for a time suspended my utterances. Twelve years ago, in vision or reality, I certainly saw you. I could not forget your face. It has remained before my eyes ever since. So they're like the Spider-Man meme of the two Spider-Men pointing at each other. So this girl is saying that she had a dream seeing Laura as a child. And Laura's saying she had a dream seeing this girl as a child. Her smile had softened. Whatever I had fancied strange in it was gone. And in it, her dimpling cheeks were now delightfully pretty and intelligent. I felt reassured, and continued more in the vein which hospitality indicated to bid her welcome, and tell her how much pleasure her accidental arrival had given us all, and especially what a happiness it was to me. I took her hand as I spoke. I was a little shy, as lonely people are, but the situation made me eloquent and even bold. She pressed my hand, she laid hers upon it, and her eyes glowed. As, looking hastily into mine, she smiled again and blushed. She answered my welcome very prettily. I sat down beside her, still wondering, and she said, I must tell you, my vision about you, it is so very strange that you and I should have had each of the other so vivid a dream, that each should have seen I you and you me looking as we do now, when of course we both were mere children. I was a child, about six years old, and I awoke from a confused and troubled dream and found myself in a room, unlike my nursery, wainscotted clumsily in some dark wood and with cupboards and bedsteads and chairs and benches placed all about it. The beds were, I thought, all empty, and the room itself without anyone but myself in it. And I, after looking about me for some time and admiring especially an iron candlestick with two branches, which I should certainly know again, crept under one of the beds to reach the window. But as I got from under the bed, I heard someone crying, and looking up, while I was still upon my knees, saw you, most assuredly you, as I see you now. A beautiful young lady with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips, your lips, you, as you are here. Your looks won me. I climbed onto the bed and put my arms about you, and I think we both fell asleep. I was aroused by a scream. You were sitting up screaming. I was frightened and slipped down upon the ground, and it seemed to me lost consciousness for a moment, and when I came to myself, I was again in my nursery at home. Your face I have never forgotten since. I could not be misled by mere resemblance. You are the lady whom I saw. It was now my turn to relate my corresponding vision, which I did, to the undisguised wonder of my acquaintance. I don't know which should be most afraid of the other, she said, again smiling. If you were less pretty, I think I should be very much afraid of you. But being as you are, and you and I both so young, I feel only that I have made your acquaintance twelve years ago, and have already a right to intimacy. At all events, it does seem as if we were from our earliest childhood to be friends. I wonder if you feel as strangely drawn towards me as I do to you. I never had a friend. Shall I find one now? She sighed, 
and fine dark eyes gaze passionately on me. Now the truth is, I felt rather unaccountably towards the beautiful stranger. I did feel, as she said, drawn towards her, but there was also something of repulsion. In this feeling, however, the sense of attraction immensely prevailed. She interested and won me. She was so beautiful and so incredibly engaging. So this dream that Carmilla talks about, she says that when she was a kid, she had a dream of seeing adult Laura. And when Laura was a kid, she had a dream of seeing adult Carmilla. And how weird that is. I have always read this as Carmilla is lying. She's making this up that Carmilla, as an adult, because she's a vampire, right? Spoilers, Carmilla is a vampire. As an adult vampire, she visited Laura as a child. And it went wrong. She was trying to drink Laura's blood. Laura screamed. Nurses came. Carmilla had to skedaddle. So Carmilla makes up the story of the shared dream as a way to justify this blunder she made 12 years ago. She was never a child at the time. She never dreamt at the time of seeing adult Laura. She's making it all up now to make Laura be like, oh, I'll never have to worry about that again. 12 years of trauma and nightmares. Whew, glad that's over. But I know other scholars like to read this as Carmilla telling the truth and that this shared dream is some sort of meaningful thing, this meaningful connection that both Laura and Carmilla have to each other. I don't agree with that reading. Um, there's a lot of, I, I don't know if it's Freudian, but sort of that kind of psychoanalytical analysis of Carmilla and Laura dealing with their mother issues. Um, Carmilla's mother is obviously very strange if she is even her real mother, but this mother figure that Carmilla has who dropped her off at the castle, this con artist woman who staged a fake carriage crash to get Carmilla to be invited in. And Laura's mother, who she lost at a young age and all these other mother figures we have, we see a lot of them taking the mothering roles and replacing each other for that. And there's a lot of overanalyzed stuff about that. Um, I don't really agree with those readings either, but they're interesting to consider. Um, the book Our Vampires Ourselves has a good section on it. If you want to find out a lot of that, that like really deep lore into the psychoanalysis, recommend reading that one. But the way I read it, this dream Carmilla's describing is completely a lie. She's doing it to mess with Laura's head. Laura is a very smart lady. So of course, Carmilla has to come up with something very elaborate to get Laura to th forget this dream and, you know, think everything's okay. Because how else is she going to describe having the same face as someone who should have been a child 12 years ago? Oh, and Carmilla says, I've never had a friend before. Are we going to be friends now? You know, she's ostensibly 19 years old, but she's never had a friend before in her life. Laura's special. She's going to be Carmilla's first friend. And Laura feels incredibly drawn to her, but also kind of repulsed by her because she's really overly friendly, really fast. But has Laura mentioned she's lonely? She's so lonely that she's going to take it. She'll take it. I perceive now something of languor and exhaustion stealing over her and hasten to bid her good night. The doctor thinks, I added, that you ought to have a maid to sit up with you tonight. One of ours is waiting, and you will find her a very useful and quiet creature. Yes, maids are creatures. They're not people. How kind of you, but I could not sleep. I never could with an attendant in the room. I shan't require any assistance, and shall I confess my weakness? I am haunted with the terror of robbers. Our house was robbed once, and two servants murdered, so I always lock my door. It has become habit, and you look so kind, I know you will forgive me. I see there is a key in the lock. Is it rude to lock your door when you're staying in strangers' house? I guess she's worried it's rude, so she's going she's gonna to lock her door because she's got an irrational fear of robbers, which, you know, you do you. Lock your door. I know it's for vampire reasons, but she's got a cover store for everything, doesn't she? She held me close in her pretty arms for a moment and whispered in my ear, Good night, darling. It is very hard to part with you, but good night. Tomorrow, but not early, I shall see you again. She sank back on the pillow with a sigh, and her fine eyes followed me with a fond and melancholy gaze, and she murmured again, Good night, dear friend. Young people like and even love on impulse. You know, old people do that too. I was flattered by the evident, though as yet undeserved, fondness she showed me. I liked the confidence with which she at once received me. She was determined that we should be very near friends. Next day came and we met again. I was delighted with my companion, that is to say, in many respects. 
Her looks lost nothing in daylight. She was certainly the most beautiful creature I had ever seen. And the unpleasant remembrance of the face presented in my early dream had lost the effect of the first unexpected recognition. She confessed that she had experienced a similar shock on seeing me, and precisely the same faint antipathy that had mingled with my admiration of her. We now laughed together over our momentary horrors. I was horrified when I first saw you. You're completely gorgeous, but it creeped me out because you bit me once when I was a girl and you haven't aged a day in 12 years and it was really frightening even though you're gorgeous, but I'm totally over that now and you look as pretty in the daylight as you do in the moonlight, so, so it's okay. So this trope of the very alluring, very beautiful vampire, that lie the vampire as a deception, as a lie of something monstrous and horrifying hiding beneath a beautiful veneer. It's a very common trope in vampire fiction, not one that Dracula himself really employs. Um, Dracula is not described as attractive or alluring at all in the actual text of Dracula, but Dracula's brides are supposed to be very alluring. And we think that a lot of Stoker's influence of what he took for the vampire brides and that other vampire girl in Dracula's guest that got cut out of the final version came from this trope in Carmilla. And nowadays we see this trope applied to male vampires all the time. And I've always thought of this vampire trope as one of the most horrifying of vampire tropes because it's one thing to have a monster attacking you, wanting to kill you or make you a monster even more scary. But it's another thing to have this monster hidden right in front of you, not just in plain sight in someone you wouldn't suspect, but in someone that you especially were attracted to and desired because they were so beautiful. Someone who you wanted to be your best friend turns out to be this monster. That level of betrayal, that extra betrayal is part of what makes the vampire top tier monster, in my opinion the most human of monsters, because these people exist in real life, right? Someone who's so alluring and so pretty and so attractive, and then they betray you in some horrible way, or you find out that they're actually secretly a douchebag. They don't have to be a blood-sucking vampire, but they could suck your life away in some other way. And that vampire metaphor, mwah. Chapter four, her habits, a saunter. Saunter is another word for a walk. So, you know, this, in this chapter, they're going to take a walk. I told you that I was charmed with her in most particulars. There were some that did not please me so well. I shall begin by describing her. She was above middle height of women. She was slender and wonderfully graceful, except that her movements were languid, very languid indeed. There was nothing in her appearance to indicate an invalid. Her complexion was rich and brilliant. Her features were small and beautifully formed. Her eyes large, dark, and lustrous. Her hair was quite wonderful. I never saw hair so magnificently thick and long when it was down about her shoulders. I have often placed my hands under it and laughed with wonder at its weight. It was exquisitely fine and soft, and in color a rich, very dark brown with something of gold. I loved to let it down, tumbling with its own weight as, in her room, she lay back in her chair, talking in her sweet, low voice. I used to fold and braid it, and spread it out and play with it. Heavens, if I had but known all! So, Laura clearly finds this girl very aesthetically pleasing. There's nothing in here really to indicate attraction on Laura's part. Just because she finds her beautiful doesn't mean that she is lusting after Carmilla necessarily. Though you could certainly read it that way considering how much she does go on about her beauty. But remember, Laura was very lonely. But to know that she was playing with this vampire's hair and then we have this breaking the fourth wall. Heavens, if I had but known all! She has this hindsight of horror to know how into this hair she was, how much she played with it, how much she touched this girl, how much she was affectionate with her in this trusting, trusting way before she, you know, the dark inevitable betrayal. Which, if you're reading this for the first time, you wouldn't know about in 1872. But of course, we all know now what a vampire is. I said there were particulars which did not please me. Yeah, she starts this paragraph being like, let me tell you the things I don't like about Carmilla. Oh, but she was so pretty and her hair was so great. Anyway, oh, but yeah, back, back to the things I don't like about Carmilla. 
I have told you that her confidence won me the first night I saw her, but I found that she exercised with respect to herself, her mother, her history, everything in fact connected with her life, plans, and people, an ever wakeful reserve. I dare say I was unreasonable, perhaps I was wrong. I dare say I ought to have respected the solemn injunction laid upon my father by the stately lady in black velvet. But curiosity is a restless, unscrupulous passion, and no one girl can endure with patience that hers should be baffled by another. What harm could it do anyone to tell me what I so ardently desire to know? Had she no trust in my good sense or honor? Why would she not believe me when I assured her so solemnly that I would not divulge one syllable of what she told me to any mortal breathing? There was a coldness, it seemed to me, beyond her years in her, smiling, melancholy, persistent refusal to afford me the least ray of light. I cannot say we quarreled upon this point, for she would not quarrel upon any. It was, of course, very unfair of me to press her, very ill-bred, but I really could not help it, and I might just as well have let it alone. So Laura is being utterly obnoxious, being like, tell me, tell me, tell me your secrets, tell me, tell me, tell me, and Carmel is like, what she did tell me amounted, in my unconscionable estimation, to nothing. It was all summed up in three very vague disclosures. First, her name was Carmilla. Second, her family was very ancient and noble. Third, her home lay in the direction of the West. She would not tell me the name of her family, nor their immemorial bearings, nor the name of their estate, nor even that of the country they lived in. But we know they speak French and English, and she uses the word matska, which is a Czech or Polish word used for a female servant. So we can assume maybe that was the black woman in the uh, carriage with them, unless she had other servants in there. So she, she might be Czech, she might be Polish, might be French, might be probably not English because, you know, vampires never are. They're always foreign and exotic. You are not to suppose that I worried her incessantly on these subjects. Oh, so you weren't completely annoying, Laura. You, you weren't. Okay, I won't. I won't suppose that. I watched for opportunity and rather insinuated than urged my inquiries. Once or twice, indeed, I did attack her more directly. But no matter what my tactics, utter failure was invariably the result. Reproaches and caresses were all lost upon her <laughs> She's caressing Carmilla, trying to get the truth out. Maybe if I rub her nicely, the truth will come out. But I must add this, that her evasion was conducted with so pretty a melancholy and appreciation, with so many and even passionate declarations of her liking for me and trust in my honor, and with so many promises that I should at last know all, that I could not find it in my heart long to be offended with her. So Carmela saying, don't worry, I'll tell you one day. When mom comes back in three months, you will know all, I promise. I just can't tell you now. And the way I always read this part was that I thought Carmilla intends to turn Laura into a vampire. And she's telling Laura, I can't tell you the truth now, because apparently she can't lie. Um, she can't tell the truth either, because the truth is I'm a vampire. But she promises Laura, don't worry, you will know everything, I promise. And that's what makes me think that it was her intention to turn Laura into a vampire. And then, then she could tell her everything. That's how I read it. She used to place her pretty arms about my neck, draw me to her, and laying her cheek to mine, murmur with her lips near my ear, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation, I live in your warm life, and you shall die, die, sweetly die into mine. I cannot help it. As I draw near to you, you, in your turn, will draw near to others, and learn the rapture of that cruelty, which yet is love. So, for a while, seek to know no more of me and mine. But trust me with all your loving spirit. So yeah, that sounds to me that she, she plans to turn Laura into a vampire and make her like her die, die into my life. Yeah, when you die and become a vampire, then, then you'll be in my life. Then you'll know these things. But before that happens, you're going to love other people. And I don't like that. I can't do that. 
and when she had spoken such a rhapsody, she would press me more closely in her trembling embrace, and her lips and soft kisses gently glowed upon my cheek. Again, not necessarily gay, yet girls kissed each other like this and hugged each other like this all the time in perfectly platonic ways. Her agitations and her language were unintelligible to me. From these foolish embraces, which were not of very frequent occurrence, I must allow, I used to wish to extract myself, but my energies seemed to fail me. So yeah, Carmilla is making Laura a little uncomfortable with this. It's, it's not enough to make Laura suspect there's something weird going on, but she's still, she's not comfortable being hugged and kissed like this by this person. Her murmured words sounded like a lullaby in my ear and soothed my resistance into a trance from which I only seemed to recover myself when she withdrew her arms. So that charm of the vampire, even though Laura's emotionally uncomfortable being touched this way by this person, she can't resist it because she's entering this trance-like state while she's there. In these mysterious moods, I did not like her. I experienced a strange, tumultuous excitement that was pleasurable ever and anon, mingled with a vague sense of fear and disgust. I had no distinct thoughts about her while such scenes lasted, but I was conscious of a love growing into adoration and also of abhorrence. This, I know, is a paradox, but I can make no other attempt to explain the feeling. So that she likes it is also repulsive to her. This is getting into taboo territory. She's only 19, you know? Feelings are real at that age. It's interesting to see a vampire seductress using techniques that aren't stereotypically seductive. Carmilla is approaching the seduction very sweetly, very innocently. She's not pressuring, like the way you see the vampire brides attacking men where they're all boobs out, tongues out. Take me, Jonathan, I'm yours. But Carmilla is sweet, innocent, little tiny kisses, warm hugs. And this is the kind of seduction she does. The nicest, sweetest vampire seduction ever. But as we know, Laura is a very smart girl, so she's not going to fall for it completely. She will always feel that repulsion because she knows something is not quite right. She is not going to completely fall for it. I now write, after an interval of more than ten years, with a trembling hand, with a confused and horrible recollection of certain occurrences and situations in the ordeal through which I was unconsciously passing, though with a vivid and very sharp remembrance of the main current of my story. But, I suspect, in all lives there are certain emotional scenes, those in which our passions have been most wildly and terribly roused, that are, of all others, the most vaguely and dimly remembered. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardor of a lover. It embarrassed me. It was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips traveled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper, almost in sobs, you are mine, and you shall be mine. You and I are one forever. Then she had thrown herself back into her chair with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. And not trembling in the good way, or at least ten years later, Laura would have us believe. She is quite insistent that she was not into Carmilla having the ardor of a lover towards her at all. Now, a lot of people like to read Laura as equally gay as Carmilla, and that is valid. But I do not read Laura as actually attracted to Carmilla in a lover's way. She finds her quite attractive, but she's not attracted to her. She has this repulsion. And any time Carmilla makes actual gay advances on her, like this last one, Laura's not into it. Are we related? I used to ask. What can you mean by all this? I remind you, perhaps, of someone whom you love. But you must not. I hate it. I don't know you. I don't know myself when you look and talk so. Laura is not into it. No means no, Carmilla. She used to sigh at my vehemence, then turn away and drop my hand. 
You know, a lot of people like to read this as Laura protesting too much. Yes, she was secretly into it. No actually means yes, she did want in Carmilla's pence. I don't read it that way, but you know, read it however you like. Remember, this is the section of the book where she's telling us the very few rare things that she doesn't like about her new best friend. Everything else she likes. These are the things she doesn't. Respecting these very extraordinary manifestations, I strove in vain to form any satisfactory theory. I could not refer them to affection or trick. It was unmistakably the momentary breaking out of suppressed instinct and emotion. So she, she really believes that Carmilla does feel this way, but she just can't figure out why. I think Laura doesn't know that gay people exist, so she can't think that that's the reason. So she's like, hmm, are we secretly relatives? And she's just like, yes, my cousin, I love you so much. That could be the reason. Hmm. Was she, notwithstanding her mother's volunteer denial, subject to brief visitations of insanity? Yes, because if a woman acts attracted to another woman, she, she's got to be insane. Because that's just, it's not a thing that people do. Or was there here a disguise and a romance? I had read in old storybooks of such things. What if a boyish lover had found his way into the house and sought to persecute his suit in masquerade with the assistance of a clever old adventuress? But there were many things against this hypothesis, highly interesting as it was to my vanity. So Laura's like, what if Carmilla's a boy in disguise and she's in love with me and she got this mom person to pull off this trick and get her into my house? But no, she can't be a boy in disguise. But you're not far from the truth, Laura. Just, you know, all you need to do is acknowledge that gay people exist. I could boast of no little attention such as masculine gallantry delights to offer. Between these passionate moments, there were long intervals of commonplace, of gaiety, of brooding melancholy, during which, except that I detected her eyes so full of melancholy fire following me, at times I might have seen as nothing to her. So even though Carmilla acts so into Laura sometimes, there's like tons of other times where she acts like she doesn't even notice Laura's there, except for the fact that she's got melancholy fire in her eyes following Laura, which Laura does notice, so... But Laura's a very smart girl. Even though she's dismissing these things, it, they're getting through. She's picking up. She's just, she, she hasn't put the puzzle pieces together yet. Except in these brief periods of mysterious excitement, her ways were girlish. And there was always a languor about her, quite incompatible with masculine system in the state of health. Oh yeah, see, she can't be a boy in disguise because boys never have languor. They're, you know, masculine systems in the state of health are always exactly the same. Poor Laura. This toxic masculinity stuff has really messed you up couldn't see the lesbian right in front of you. In some respects, her habits were odd. Perhaps not so singular in the opinion of a town lady like you, as they appeared to us rustic people. Well, so now it sounds like Laura's talking to a specific town lady that she's telling all this to, because as we know, she had written all this down and then the occult doctor compiled it later. But earlier it sounded like she was talking collectively to people who live in towns, so could go either way. But you know, you who don't live lonely lives, you don't get it. You don't get how lonely Laura is. And also, people who aren't lonely apparently keep better habits than Carmilla keeps. So, you know, you who live in town, you may be slovenly like Carmilla, but Laura doesn't get it. She used to come down very late, generally not till one o'clock. She means when she gets up from bed in the morning or in the afternoon. She would then take a cup of chocolate, but eat nothing. We then went out for a walk which was a mere saunter, and she seemed almost immediately exhausted, and either returned to the schloss or sat on one of the benches that were placed here and there among the trees. This was a bodily languor in which her mind did not sympathize. She was always an animated talker and very intelligent. She sometimes alluded for a moment to her own home, or mentioned an adventure or situation or an early recollection which indicated a people of strange manners and described customs of which we knew nothing. I gathered from these chance hints that her native country was much more remote than I had at first fancied. Ah, yes. So even though Laura already lives in a gothic foreign land of Styria, even though, you know, she's properly English for all intents and purposes, Carmilla lives in an even more exotic foreign land with strange customs. As we sat thus one afternoon under the trees, a funeral passed us by. It was that of a pretty young girl whom I had often seen, the daughter of one of the rangers of the forest. The poor man was walking behind the coffin of his darling, 
She was his only child, and he looked quite heartbroken. Peasants walking two and two came behind. They were singing a funeral hymn. I rose to mark my respect as they pass, and joined in the hymn that they were very sweetly singing. My companion shook me a little roughly, and I turned surprised. She said brusquely, "'Don't you perceive how discordant that is?' "'I think it's very sweet, on the contrary,' I answered, vexed at the interruption, and very uncomfortable, lest the people who composed the little procession should observe and resent what was passing. I resumed, therefore, instantly, and was again interrupted. "'You pierce my ears,' said Carmilla, almost angrily, and stopping her ears with her tiny fingers. "'Besides, how can you tell that your religion and mine are the same? "'Your forms wound me, and I hate funerals. "'What a fuss! Why, you must die! "'Everyone must die, and all are happier when they do. "'Come home!' "'So apparently Carmilla follows a different religion than Laura does, "'and Carmilla's religion is that death isn't a big deal, "'everyone dies, don't make a fuss about it, "'and funeral music hurts her ears. "'Mysterious.' "'My father has gone on with the clergyman to the churchyard.' I thought you knew she was to be buried today. She? I don't trouble my head about peasants. I don't know who she is, answered Carmilla with a flash from her fine eyes. She is the poor girl who fancied she saw a ghost a fortnight ago and has been dying ever since till yesterday when she expired. Tell me nothing about ghosts. I shan't sleep tonight if you do. I hope there's no plague or fever coming. All this looks very like it, I continued. The swineherd's young wife died only a week ago, and she thought something seized her by the throat as she lay in her bed and nearly strangled her. Papa says such horrible fancies do accompany some forms of fever. She was quite well the day before. She sank afterwards and died before a week. Well, her funeral is over, I hope, and her hymn sung, and our eyes shan't be tortured with that discord and jargon. It has made me nervous. Sit down here beside me, sit close, hold my hand, press it hard, hard, harder. We had moved a little back and had come to another seat. She sat down. Her face underwent a change that alarmed and even terrified me for a moment. It darkened and became horribly livid. Her teeth and hands were clenched, and she frowned and compressed her lips while she stared down upon the ground at her feet and trembled all over with a continued shudder as irrepressible as Og. All her energies seemed strained to suppress a fit with which she was then breathlessly tugging, and at length a low, convulsive cry of suffering broke from her and gradually... The hysteria subsided. There, that comes from strangling people with hymns, she said at last. Hold me, hold me still. It is passing away. And so gradually it did. And perhaps to dissipate the somber impression which the spectacle had left upon me, she became unusually animated and chatty. And so we got home. This was the first time I had seen her exhibit any definable symptoms of that delicacy of health which her mother had spoken of. It was the first time, also, I had seen her exhibit anything like temper. Both passed away like a summer cloud, and never but once afterwards did I witness on her part a momentary sign of anger. I will tell you how it happened. But before she does, I just want to talk about the scene that happened. So this funeral is passing by of this young, pretty girl who just died and Carmilla freaks out. She doesn't want to see it. She doesn't want to hear it. She doesn't like to be reminded of death. And then Laura mentions that another young lady died recently in the town. So this girl died this week, but she's been sick for two weeks. And the other lady died last week. So the impression we're to get is that Carmilla being a vampire, has been going off into town and feeding on these women, attacking these women. But to her, they're peasants. She doesn't know peasants. She doesn't want to know peasants. So to her, they're food. Unlike Laura, who is her special bestest friend, who we are being led to believe that maybe she wants to keep and turn into a vampire. These women, she just drinks until they die. It takes her about two weeks between initial attack for the person to die. And... We aren't to believe that these women who died from a vampire will now become vampires. This isn't like in Dracula, where the vampire's victims then rise as a vampire. This is a different system. These are just victims. They're peasants. They don't matter. But when Carmilla thinks about it, when she spends too much time focused on the nature of what she is and what she has to do, that she has killed these women, she has a panic attack. It really upsets her. So in a way, she is also a bit of a reluctant vampire. She doesn't say, woe is me, I am tragic and emo and anguish. But 
it is difficult for her to face the effects of being a vampire. And again, this is a little bit inspired, or at least a nod to Varney the Vampire, who is known as being literary history's first reluctant vampire. I wouldn't call Carmilla reluctant per se, but there, there's, there's layers here. There's complexity here. It's a big deal. So now Laura is going to tell us the second time that Carmilla ever showed her anger. She and I were looking out of one of the long drawing room windows when there entered the courtyard over the drawbridge a figure of a wanderer whom I knew very well. He used to visit the Schloss generally twice a year. It was the figure of a hunchback with the sharp lean features that generally accompany deformity. He wore a pointed black beard and he was smiling from ear to ear showing his white fangs. He was dressed in buff, black and scarlet and crossed with more straps and belts that I could count, from which hung all manner of things. Behind, he carried a magic lantern and two boxes, which I knew well, in one of which was a salamander, and in the other a mandrake. These monsters used to make my father laugh. They were compounded of parts of monkeys, parrots, squirrels, fish, and hedgehogs, dried and stitched together with great neatness and startling effect. He had a fiddle, a box of conjuring apparatus, a pair of foils and masks attached to his belt, several other mysterious cases dangling about him, and a black staff with copper ferrules in his hand. His companion was a rough spare dog that followed at his heels, but stopped short suspiciously at the drawbridge, and in a little while began to howl dismally. Oh, the dog won't cross the drawbridge. What does the dog know? Does the dog know something's up at the castle that's not usually up at the castle? Dogs are smart. They know things. And Laura noticed. Laura's smart, too. She hasn't put the pieces together yet, but it's all there. In the meantime, the mountebank, standing in the midst of the courtyard, raised his grotesque hat and made us a very ceremonious bow, paying his compliments very volubly in exorable French and German, not much better. Then, disengaging his fiddle, began to scrape a lively air to which he sang with a merry discord, dancing with ludicrous airs and activity that made me laugh in spite of the dog's howling. Then he advanced to a window with many smiles and salutations, and his hat in his left hand, his fiddle under his arm, with a fluency that never took breath, he gabbled a long advertisement of all his accomplishments and the resources of various arts at which he placed at our service, and the curiosities and entertainments which it was in his power, at our bidding, to display. So this is like the guy that goes door to door trying to sell you stuff, or he's like, you know, I can, I can entertain you. I can dance for you. Pay me money. I'll do anything. Just pay me, please. You want to buy something? You want to see my taxidermied weirdo animals? Just pay me money. Or pay me to go away. But Laura likes this guy. I, you know, she's very lonely and bored. He's one of the only entertainments that comes around. Will your ladyships be pleased to buy an amulet against an oopire, which is going like wolf, I hear, through these woods, he said, dropping his hat on the pavement. They are dying of it, right and left, and there is a charm that never fails, only pinned to the pillow, and you may laugh in his face. So upire is another word for vampire. And apparently there's a rumor going around that there's a vampire attacking people. You know those two women that died recently? Well, you know, rumors are bound to happen. So this guy has a charm that will keep the vampire away. And he's trying to sell it to the vampire and her friend. These charms consisted of oblong slips of vellum with cabalistic ciphers and diagrams upon them. Carmilla instantly purchased one, and so did I. I love Carmilla. She's like, oh, a charm to keep vampires away? Don't mind if I do, thanks. She has a sense of humor. He was looking up, and we were smiling down upon him, amused. At least I can answer for myself. His piercing black eye, as he looked up in our faces, seemed to detect something that fixed for a moment his curiosity. In an instant, he unrolled a leather case full of all manner of odd little steel instruments. See here, my lady, he said, displaying it and addressing me. I profess, among other things less useful, the art of dentistry. Plague take the dog, he interpolated, because the dog is still howling at nothing. What could he be howling at? Silence, beast, he howls so that your ladyships can scarcely hear a word. Your noble friend, the young lady at your right, has the sharpest tooth, long, thin, pointed, like an awl, like a needle, ha ha, with my sharp and long sight as I look up, I have seen it distinctly. Hmm. Now, if it happens to hurt the young lady, and I think it must, here am I, here are my file, my punch, my nippers, I will make it round and blunt, if her ladyship pleases, no longer the tooth of a fish, but of a beautiful young lady as she is. Hey, is the young lady displeased? Have I been too bold? Have I offended her? 
The young lady indeed looked very angry as she drew back from the window. How dare that mountebank insult us so? Where is your father? I shall demand redress from him. My father would have had the wretch tied up to the pump and flogged with a cart whip and burnt to the bones with a castle brand. She retired from the window a step or two and sat down and had hardly lost sight of the offender when her wrath subsided as suddenly as it had risen and she gradually recovered her usual tone and seemed to forget the little hunchback in his follies. So this guy is looking at her. She's smiling at him. She's like, oh, he's still vampire charms. That's so cute. But she's smiling so big that he sees one of her vampire fangs. Just one. I don't know why he didn't see both of them. And we know she has two because Laura felt the sensation of two needles piercing her breast. But he only sees one of her vampire fangs, which Laura has apparently never noticed or mentioned to us before. And he's like, hey, you got a really long snaggle tooth there, lady. I could file that down for you because it's got to be pointy and hurdy in your mouth. And Carmilla's like, <gasps> How dare, jerk. It's interesting that Laura never gives us an opinion on this. And for as much as she talks about how gorgeous and beautiful Carmilla is, there was never a caveat like, yeah, except she had weird teeth. But you know, it was oldie times. Maybe everyone had weird teeth back then. It said itself that the mountebank hunchback guy himself had fangs. And if he has fangs and he thinks this girl's teeth are weird, then you know, they gotta be extra weird. My father was out of spirits that evening. On coming in, he told us that there had been another case very similar to the two fatal ones which had lately occurred. You know, another woman dying in the village. The sister of a young peasant on his estate, only a mile away, was very ill, had been, as she described it, attacked very nearly in the same way, and was now slowly but steadily sinking. All this, said my father, is strictly referable to natural causes. These poor people infect one another with their superstitions and so repeat in imagination the things of terror that have infested their neighbors. But that very circumstance frightens one horribly, said Carmilla. How so? inquired my father. I am so afraid of fancying I see things. I think it would be as bad as reality. We are in God's hands. Nothing can happen without his permission, and all will end well for those who love him. He is our faithful creator. He has made us all and will take care of us. So again, we have another pompous Englishman who's like, they're all talking about the oopire causing all these beautiful young women to die, but there's no such things. These are all natural causes and God will take care of us. Yeah, everything's fine. <laughs> I'm so British. Creator, nature said the young lady in answer to my gentle father. And this disease that invades the country is natural, nature. All things proceed from nature, don't they? All things in the heaven, in the earth, and under the earth act and live as nature ordains? I think so. <laughs> so Carmilla's is like, you know what? Even if vampires were real, they would be nature. So yeah, you're not wrong. It is a natural cause because vampires are natural. The doctor said he would come here today, said my father after a silence. I want to know what he thinks about it and what he thinks we had better do. Doctors never did me any good, said Carmilla. Then have you been ill? I asked. More ill than ever you were, she announced. Long ago? Yes, a long time. I suffered from this very illness. She means the one that's attacking the women in the village. But I forget all but my pain and weakness and they were not so bad as are suffered in other diseases. You were very young then, I dare say. Let us talk no more of it. You would not wound a friend. She looked languidly in my eyes and passed her arm round my waist lovingly and led me out of the room. My father was busy over some papers near the window. Why does your papa like to frighten us? Said the pretty girl with a sigh and a little shudder. He doesn't, dear Carmilla. It's the very furthest thing from his mind. Are you afraid, dearest? I should be very much if I fancied there was any real danger of my being attacked as those poor people were. You are afraid to die? Yes, everyone is. But to die as lovers may? To die together? So that they may live together? Girls are caterpillars while they live in the world, to be finally butterflies when the summer comes. But in the meantime, there are grubs and larvae, don't you see? Each with their particular propensities, necessities, and structure. So says Monsieur Buffon in his big book in the next room. So she's talking about death and metamorphosis in the same breath. Very mysterious, very obscure. Laura's like, heck yeah, I'm afraid to die. If I got attacked like those women say they got attacked, I'd be scared. And Carmilla's like, would it really be so bad? I had that disease once and it wasn't as bad as other things. 
Laura seems unconvinced. Later in the day, the doctor came and was closeted up with Papa for some time. He was a skillful man of 60 and upwards. He wore powder and shaved his pale face as smooth as a pumpkin. He and Papa emerged from the room together, and I heard Papa laugh and say as they came out, Well, I do wonder at a wise man like you. What do you say to hippogriffs and dragons? The doctor was smiling and made an answer, shaking his head. Nevertheless, life and death are mysterious states, and we know little of the resources of either. And so they walked on, and I heard no more. I did not then know what the doctor had been broaching, but I think I guess of it now. And to the reader, especially in the serialized format that was originally released, they wouldn't have known what Laura guessed. I could tell you right now what she guessed. She guessed that this doctor believed in the upire, the vampire. This doctor comes in and he's like, well, maybe it is a vampire that's attacking these women. And maybe we should be precautious and worried and careful. And her dad comes out and he's like, oh, 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 you're going to believe in hippogriffs and dragons next? Pshaw, no such thing as vampires. And the doctor's like... Life is mysterious. I'd be worried if I were you. And Dad's like, psh, I'm British. We'll leave that there for now. Thank you for joining me for this vampire read-through, and we will continue to read next time more Carmilla. Yes, we got to the sexy gay parts this time, but there is more to come, I promise you. Will Laura be won over, or will she stay repulsed of the vampire lesbian until the end? and supported my videos. You are the best. Thank you for being here. If you would like to suggest other books that we can read together on vampire read-throughs, by the way, the reason I'm doing vampire read-throughs instead of vampire reviews lately is because of my particular circumstances during quarantine, during lockdown. Hopefully it won't be like this forever and I will get back to scripted reviews soon. But in the meantime, thank you so much to everyone who said they'd enjoy this series. I hope to keep providing it for you as much as I can. If you can support me on Patreon, you can help make this happen. If you can't support me on Patreon, leave me a comment because those really help. Also, like and subscribe to keep up to date. I will be back very soon with the next installment 